from time to time I come across a, a news item that sort of catches my breath and makes me groan aloud with uh, surprise and grief. One such news item did that this week. This past fall, I read a new abortion clinic was opened in Washington, D.C., called by reporters a mega facility. Planned Parenthood celebrated the opening of this new and perhaps their most prominent facility there in our capital. That isn't what caught me by surprise, by the way. Frankly, I, I expect the unbelieving world to defy the Creator and deny the value of life, whether it's a preborn baby or a newborn baby, or as we're hearing more and more, an elderly person who just needs to go ahead and, you know, get over it and die and get off the medical expense uh, problems and burdens. I expect the unbeliever to do whatever it takes to make their lives free, to do whatever they want unencumbered, to remove whatever gets in their self-centered way, whether it is uh, even if it is an unborn child. I, I expect that kind of decision from those who rebel against the law of God written on their hearts. But what's, what surprised me and even gave me greater grief regarding this national sin and rebellion against God were the people involved in this ribbon-cutting ceremony. The article reads that Various church leaders and, and various religious leaders representing more than 20 different religious organizations participated in the opening ceremony. In fact, there's a photograph in uh, the article I read, and there they stand, they're all smiling, some of them in suits and ties, some of them in gowns, robes, and stoles. The participation of church leaders in this event, by the way, led the CEO of Planned Parenthood for this region when she was interviewed to sort of gush with pride and say, and I quote her, their presence, that is the religious leaders, their presence confirms the sacredness of the work we do. She went on to say in almost every message to our staff, I talk about our doing sacred work. She said, pro-lifers are trying to separate those of us who support the right of women to choose abortion, get this, who choose abortion from a sense of deep spirituality. In other words, aborting a baby is now the result of deep spiritual thought. If you can imagine the religious hypocrisy of this ceremony, the article wrote that just before the official larger ceremony kicked off, all the religious leaders gathered upstairs in this facility for a time of prayer. It was led off by a Jewish rabbi. It included leaders from Protestant denominations, including Hindu priests and even an Islamic imam who was Skyped in so he could pray. They formed a prayer circle and pledged their support to make, quote, the world whole and holy, unquote. The article wrote the director of the new facility says she plans to tell patients that the abortion facility is now, quote, blessed space because those of faith support your decision. And then they ended it a little pseudo-spiritual ceremony by singing this little light of mine. And I moaned just like you did. Mankind's rebellion against the sanctity of life revealed in God's Word that begins with fertilization. Through God's creation, and God's authority, and God's design. Look, religious leader or not, the rebellion in that shape and form and, and, and others has led to uh, tragic uh, perversions and blatant hypocrisy and even more bizarre wordsmithing like what I just gave you. I mean, imagine using words like blessed space, sacred work, deep spirituality, and holiness for a facility dedicated to nothing less than taking the lives of unborn children. You know, it reminded me all over again that the human heart, including mine, how about you, 
is capable of redefining, condoning, approving, making right, making holy, yes, making it viewed as approved by God, anything it wants when it decides to defy God. In fact, you are willing to sacrifice anything for the sake of whatever it is you worship. And when you worship yourself, you're willing to sacrifice anything that gets in the way of your plans and your career and your will and your way and your money and your life. When it comes in sharp contrast to the life of someone who is forgiven of that sin and every sin when they come to faith in Jesus Christ, and they come under the authority of God's Word. It plainly and clearly speaks. You, you discover that words like holiness and deep spirituality and sacredness have different meanings from those smiling people in that photograph that I described. And you also discover, by the way, that Christianity really is about sacrificing life. But it's not somebody else's. It's your life and mine as living sacrifices unto God. Now in our last exposition in 1 Peter chapter 2 where I invite you to return, the Apostle Peter is describing for us what true holiness is. Not how the world defines it, but how God defines it. And it is more and more vastly different than that which our world defines. And that's simply one illustration. Now, if you are with us in our last study, which seems like a long time ago, we had the snow day and, and all of this. How many of you are, are here from the north? You moved here from the north. How many of you used to make fun of those of us that closed everything down with a little snow? Yes. All it takes is a little ice. Now you've realized, right? And you can't do anything. We canceled church. Now one of my staff pastors suggested that what we needed to do when it snowed, and this is not in my notes, I didn't say it at any other hour, it just came to my mind, but what he suggested I do is get dressed, come here, get the guys to turn on the camera, and I preach. I'm staying in my jammies too, man. You're not getting me here, okay? I'm taking a day off, all right? I'm just saying. It's nothing to do with this sermon. Where in the world did that come from? Well, Peter, if you were with us in our last discussion, that's where it was a long time ago, uh, moved us into the nursery and we, we sort of heard infants longing for milk. And he used that as an illustration of the believer longing for the pure milk of of the Word. Now, Peter's going to take us out of the nursery and move us to a building site where God the Father is the building contractor, and He is engaged in building up our lives and building us, our lives, into something that really matters most. Now, what I want to do is cover the next few verses, and I'm going to do it by just simply giving you an outline if you care to write down these kinds of outlines, but the first point is simply uh, a sacred relationship, and the second point is a sacred response. Let's pick it up where we left off at chapter 2 and beginning with verse 4. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now let's stop there for a minute. Actually for about 40 minutes, okay? Here we go. Now as Peter changes the illustration from the nursery to a building site, he, he begins by drawing our attention to the, 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 the focal uh, architectural piece of this uh, building program, and it is Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. And I thought we'd get there. We're not going to get there. We'll talk more about that in our next discussion. But what Peter begins to do here is describe the Lord for those of us who love him 
and those who are considering him. And he, and he basically gives uh, our world the two reactions that to this day exist when it comes to Jesus Christ. He, on the one hand, references those who reject him. Notice he writes, he is rejected by men or mankind. Peter is quoting here from Psalm 118 verse 22 where we read the prophetic announcement that the Messiah is the stone the builders rejected. Certainly Israel and, and even to our day and, and, and beyond, including us. Now, the participle Peter uses here for the word rejected in your translation refers to someone who measures up the stone, who sizes it up, who analyzes it, and then discards it as useless. I don't want that. I don't want that stone. And that's a picture of the human race, especially those who've been encountering the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you describe the biblical Jesus to them, and they size him up, they measure him, and they say, you know what, I don't want him. He doesn't fit my life. I'm not interested. Now, whenever an unbeliever in any century hears the true representation of the gospel, among other things that bothers him about the true Jesus is that, you know, he just, he, he doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. That, that is the very thing he came to die for and pay the penalty for. So, so they discover they're in grave danger. They discover that the Bible considers them sinful and at enmity with God, and they kind of size all that up, and they say, no, thank you. I don't want that Jesus. I don't know about you. I'm sure many of you have delivered the gospel. I hope all of you have. But you've delivered the gospel if you've lived long enough, like some of us, where I can... I, I've done it enough times to where I can actually see their expression cloud over as I'm delivering the gospel uh, where Jesus moves from becoming a possible attraction to them to becoming an offense to them. And you can see it in their eyes as they shut down. That moment when Jesus becomes a confrontation to them and they don't want to hear it. That's the true Jesus. See, Peter is making the point that Jesus is not an option. He's an intersection, and you either turn to him or you're turned off by him. You either receive him or you reject him. John the Apostle clearly spelled out one of the primary motivations for that rejection when he described Jesus writing him. He said, the light capital L. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were what? Evil or wicked. The last thing we want is for somebody to expose us for evil, to expose us as wicked. They don't turn that light on. It hurts my eyes. Notice again, verse 4, you have this response of rejection, at the beginning of the verse you have the response of reception. And coming to him as a living stone, the verb he uses for coming is actually a reference not so much to initial salvation, which would be included in that, but he, he uses in this original grammar the idea of a repeated, voluntary, habitual coming to Christ for communion and, and fellowship and strength and hope. In fact, you as a believer have arrived today to do just that corporately with the body of brothers and sisters. So you've received Him. It's the same verb, by the way, the writer of Hebrews used to talk about people, believers, drawing near to God. Chapter 10 and verse 22. That's the same word used here. And to whom are we drawing near? Well, Peter describes Jesus here as a living stone. He's the only New Testament author to designate Jesus this way. And it strikes you at first, stones aren't alive. Stones might be strong or enduring, solid, but we refer to something being stone dead, not stone alive, 
if you reverse the order. But for Peter, the stone is living because this stone is a person. It's an implication of the resurrection. He's alive. And one author, in fact, picks up on the uniqueness of this expression by writing these words. No other faith can claim a living founder who has passed through death and has risen to a triumph at God the Father's right hand and remains now continually available to the immediate fellowship of each person who trusts in him. Just like he is today to you and me. And Peter goes on here in verse 4 to inform us that God the Father has measured up Jesus. He said that's what he's saying. He has sized him up and he has found him worthy of his election. The word is choice as redeemer. He adds that Jesus Christ is also precious. That is, he is of the highest value, is the expression he gives. You see, this is our opinion. We, we agree with God the Father. Jesus is our chosen redeemer, and he is precious. In other words, what the world considers worthless and discards, we consider priceless, and in him we delight. Now, what Peter uh, says next is, is surprising. He uses the same terminology for the Christian that he just used for Jesus. Notice verse 5. You also as living stones. This is another study for you perhaps on your own, but it's interesting in the New Testament a number of names or titles are, are, are given to Jesus in the singular and then they're attributed to the believer in the plural. For instance, he is the Son of God. We are called sons of God. He's called the light of the world. We at other places are called lights in the world. He's the lamb. We are called lambs. He is now here, the living stone, and we are living stones. Now, let me address this word for, for just a moment. The word Peter uses here for stones isn't just some random collection of rocks lying around on the ground that you might have as a kid, you know, threw, you might have thrown them at squirrels or other animals that come into your property. You know, it, it, he's not referring to that. He's talking about stones in a very unique way. He's talking about a stone that has been dug up from the quarry and cut and shaped and fashioned to fit the builder's purposes. What a great analogy for the Christian. We are stones dug out, rescued from the pit of sin and death and then by his grace shaped and fashioned by the divine builder to suit his divine purposes. And don't miss the fact that we are living stones because we belong to the one who is the way, the truth, and, and the life, the giver of life. And, and notice as well the implication that, that we're not quarried, we're not rescued and, and shaped to simply stand alone. There's no such thing as a freelance Christian. Peter reinforces the importance of the church body. He calls it a spiritual house that the divine contractor is building. And, and that for which we've been shaped and, and positioned. Paul uses the same language, by the way, to the Ephesians when he writes in chapter 2 of them. He says, so then you are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. See, the church is pictured by the apostles as a collection then of living, redeemed stones. In Peter's analogy, Paul talks about members of the body, ears and and feet and hands. The same idea. We have been quarried and then we have been shaped by God to fit his assignments that he has for our lives. 
The text reminds me that without the grace of God, none of us belong here. We wouldn't be here. We'd still be in the pit. We need to be rescued by the grace of God. It also reminds me that Peter doesn't say we're bricks. Manufactured to look alike and same dimensions and everything's alike. But stones, a reference to the unique variety in this house of God. A little girl I read about this past week had memorized Matthew twenty two fourteen, which she then got confused as she quoted it. The text reads, many are called, but few are chosen. And she said it this way, many are cold, and a few are frozen. <laughs> it's pretty good. We're not all manufactured to look alike. We're different. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we are living stones uniquely fashioned by God's delight for his assignment. So let me add a, a little warning to the believer. This building up structurally is, is a reference to something ongoing. And so that means that we're quarried and we're shaped, but the shaping continues. <laughs> and, and, and we must continually then submit to God's continual shaping and polishing and crafting. None of us, none of us will be satisfied without surrendering to the crafting of the divine contractor to fit inside, according to his assignment, the body of Christ. Let me add a warning to unbelievers here today. It occurs to me often, in fact, I thought about it again at this text, it occurs to me with this inspired metaphor of a building program with God building His church and each living stone added, having been rescued from the pit and added to the church, that one day it will be finished. One day he's going to be finished building the church, and the last stone is going to be added. And this era of human history as we know it will end, and the church raptured away to the Father's house. Have you yet to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Imagine you might very well be the last living stone. The last stone might be in here right now. And with you, the church, imagine, is finished. I mean, if God were to somehow tell me that, that you're the one, I wouldn't let you leave today. I mean, I really wouldn't. I'd do everything I could. You know, I'd probably get you in a headlock. I don't know what I'd do. Besides, you're holding everything up. Come on. Come on. But in all seriousness, let me, let me warn you and urge you to believe the gospel. And I don't want to torture this analogy too much, but just imagine for a moment that the last believers in China, and at noon our time today, they're going to believe. And for you, it's forever too late. Imagine if the last living stone is in Australia or the Sudan. And they're going to believe 15 minutes from now. Which means for you, it's too late. Do you really want to play around with that possibility? Somebody somewhere on the planet at some given time will be the last one quarried before the church is taken home. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ or maybe you have an image that you do but you know in your heart you don't care about him you don't care about his word you don't care about his church you're here because your parents made you come or 
you're here because your wife asked you to come or you're here because you know your business profile looks better because you did come or, or whatever but you know in your heart you really don't care about any of it and certainly you don't care about him listen somebody somewhere on the planet is going to be the last living stone I pray it will be you and I'm afraid it might not be For those of us who have believed by the grace of God and found in Christ our life and, and our hope and our strength, what's next for us? Are we just waiting for the rapture? Do we just sit around? Is that all there is to a truly sacred life? No. Oh, no. We have this sacred relationship. But now something is to take place in this sacred response. Let me show you. Look at verse 5 again. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, now notice, for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, granted, beloved, especially those of you who are older in the faith, it's easy you know, after 1,900 years in this dispensation, to, you know, the church to sort of yawn your way through that and say, yes, that, that's great. But for many of Peter's readers who were old enough to have lived in the Old Testament, who now live in the New Testament, imagine the staggering implications. And by the way, Peter was one of them. Uh, we, we call this wonderful doctrine the individual priesthood of the believer. And by the way, 400 years ago, people died because they believed this, that we might yawn through. See, in the Old Testament, God's people had a priesthood. In the New Testament, God's people are the priesthood. And that is, that's a staggering distinction. I can't imagine those early believers living in both and having to come to terms with all that it meant. Even Martin Luther, 500 years ago, that converted monk, he created a scandal uh, 500 years ago. This year, by, by resurrecting to some degree, he didn't come far enough, but he, he resurrected to some degree this doctrine when he wrote this, and I quote him, the priesthood of the New Testament is given to the whole Christian community. <gasps> Are you kidding? By writing that, he's effectively eliminating any sense of job security. He's saying, I'm not quite as important as I used to think I was. See, believers now have this direct access through Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God the Father and mankind, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And Peter is describing or implying here this stunning privilege of the New Testament believer. You can confess your sins immediately. You don't have to wait till Saturday and bring your turtle up. I mean, you sin, you confess because you're a priest. You, you can fellowship with God intimately. You can serve in his presence immediately, daily. See, here, here's, the, here's the implication. For the Old Testament believer, that, that once a year moment when the high priest went in to the Holy of Holies with a little blood to sprinkle it on the mercy see they, they, they were terrified. There was no boldness in their approach. They were singing their way through that veil. They had a rope tied around that guy's ankle, and if the bells on the hem of his garment stopped jingling, they assumed that God didn't accept it and struck them dead, and they dragged his body out. And we, we, get to go into his presence. It's as if he's, he's saying, do you realize, as a priest, you actually live inside the Holy of Holies? Daily, moment by moment, with no fear. Worship is no longer a ritual. It is a relationship. It isn't bound to one day or to one festival or one place, but to one person. This living stone to whom we've been added in this spiritual house as living stones. Now, for the Christian Life then becomes a series of offering sacred sacrifices. 
And again, he dips into the old economy in his vocabulary by calling us priests. Well, what will that mean? What do we offer? We don't have turtle doves and pigeons and bulls and rams and goats. Okay? But we are offering uh, to God sacrifices. What are they? Well, let me step outside this text and let me give you eight of them as you ran, you know, sort of uh, rummage through, uh, ransack the New Testament. Let me give you eight of them very quickly. First, we can offer to God the sacrifice of our bodies. Paul wrote to the believers living in Rome to offer their bodies a living and holy sacrifice. Paul describes the unbeliever as offering their bodies to do evil, and the believer as one who offers his body to do righteousness or right things. That's Romans chapter 6. So offering our bodies with every ability and every disability. Secondly, we offer to God the sacrifice of praise. The writer of Hebrews says this is, this is the fruit of lips, the sacrifice of praise to God, giving thanks to his name. That's Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15. It's a sacrifice unto God. The third and fourth sacrifices are in the next verse in Hebrews chapter 13, and that's verse 16, which reads, And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Again, borrowing terminology from the Old Testament. So these are the sacrifices of doing good deeds and sharing with those in need. Fifth, you can offer to God the sacrifice of financial generosity. It's interesting that Paul commends the church in Philippi for their sacrificial giving, and he again dips into the Old Testament terminology to give them uh, uh, the analogy of what their offerings uh, were. Listen as he writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now lest you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. You've done well to share with me. No church shared with me in the matter of giving. He, as a missionary, he wasn't supported very well, but by this church. And he says, I am amply supplied, having received what you have sent. And now notice, he says, what you have sent was a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Have you ever thought about the fact that whenever you give money, to God, it's a, it's a sacrifice, an aromatic, pleasing offering to God. And I want to commend this church. I thought this would be a great place to drop in what I know you've probably all been wondering as we talked about last December, our needs financially, and rejoice with you for the way that God provided through you. A lot of priests were sacrificing this gift. Typically, our month is a $500,000 budget, so we needed to make that up in December. We had a deficit of about $300,000. We wanted to make that up. And then we had extra mortgage debt that we were asking folks to give at year's end. And uh, we then prayed and waited and gave, and here are, here's what happened. By the end of December, our normal budget needs of $500,000 uh, were given. The deficit of $300,000 was eliminated. I made a snow day, but never mind, okay? <laughs> Plus, the church finished our 890 goal by giving a total to date of $600,000, which brought the month's total giving, or five weeks' total giving, to $1.4 million. Amen? Isn't that great? I, th I think so. We are... I think we got to borrow the words of Paul, amply supplied because of a lot of sacrifices by a congregation of priests. Number six, is a sacrifice most often overlooked. It's the sacrifice of converts, reconciled sinners who come to faith in Christ, who are forgiven and reconciled with God. You've delivered the gospel to them and they've believed. 
Well, in the words of the Apostle Paul, he was a minister, he writes, of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's a, a catchword for unconverted pagans. So that, get this, my offering of the Gentiles, those converts, may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit, Romans 15, 15, and 16. Uh, one commentator on this text wrote that Paul considered the souls of those God had enabled him to influence savingly for Christ as spiritual sacrifices offered and accepted by God. Have you ever offered that sacrifice to God? Have you ever delivered the gospel to someone and you have seen them, you have been with them as they prayed to believe the gospel and receive Christ? I can tell you there's no sacrifice offered to God like that one. People who come to faith under Paul's ministry were considered by Paul to be sacrifices acceptable to God. And maybe you're thinking, I'm just not around a lot of people, unconverted pagans. I spend my day chasing a three-year-old around the house. Well, that's an unconverted pagan, by the way. Don't overlook the fact. <laughs> Don't overlook the fact that you are to witness to that one. In fact, God alone knows what your sacrifice and investment into their lives will one day yield should they be reconciled to God and become one of your offerings to Him, multiplied a thousand times over. So witness to that one. Number seven is the sacrifice of love sacrificial love. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that we should imitate Christ in his sacrificial love. He wrote we should walk in love. The love just like Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God is a fragrant aroma. In other words, the self-sacrificing love of Christ for us was not only a fragrant aroma to God the Father, but an example that we should also offer that sacrifice sacrificial love. So whenever you sacrifice your will, your interests, your needs, your desires, and you demonstrate selfless love toward another, your love is actually a fragrant, aromatic offering to God. And by the way, God may be the only one who notices or appreciates it. But in the end, he's going to be the one you're going to be thrilled to hear commendation from for having offered it. Finally, number eight, it's the sacrifice of intercession or prayer. Prayer is often overlooked and undervalued as a spiritual sacrifice. It's often viewed as something less than good deeds or being on the front line or being in public. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the prayers of a committed wife, how much I appreciate the prayers of people who gathered today at 8 o'clock in the morning and prayed over me and then prayed through the hour, how much I appreciate gathering with some of our lay elder teammates before the last hour to pray. And we, frankly, the older I get, the more a mystery becomes. We have no idea how God hears and records and appreciates and rewards and orchestrates and orders and designs and responds to our prayers. But it's interesting to me, as John the Apostle writes his last letter, we call it the book of Revelation, he sees before the throne of God the prayers of believers taking physical shape, as it were, ascending to God the Father like incense. As priests, we offer the sacrificial incense of intercession. 
knowing it is heard and received by our Heavenly Father who chooses to respond according to His purposes. The Washington Post carried the story of a woman, and I'll start wrapping things up with this. She died a few years ago. Her name was Emma Daniel Gray. Every night, she had a night shift, and she would clean. In fact, for 24 years, she cleaned the White House. She took uh, pride in pursuing excellence in her work. She was diligent. Her official title was charwoman, and that title goes back to the 1600s. Char has been, you know, morphed into our word chore. She was one of the custodians, primary custodians or housemaids. She was a chore woman. She traveled every day by public transportation. She would serve behind the scenes in the White House from 1943 until her retirement in 1979. When she died a couple of years ago at the age of 95, her pastor eulogized that she not only responded to her environment, but she set the tone. She sort of set the tone to her commitment. Now, what made her life compelling to me wasn't just that she was a hard worker, but it was to read, surprisingly, out of a Washington Post article that Miss Emma, as she was called, was a committed believer. She was a hard worker, offering her work as a sacrifice to her Lord. The Washington Post article actually included this, this telling vignette, and this is where I'm trying to get to. Whenever Miss Emma cleaned the Oval Office by herself, every night she would pause, cleaning materials in one hand and with her other hand resting on the president's chair in the solitude of that office, she prayed for him. <laughs> Those who knew her and her family knew that she did this, and she was praying that God would give the president wisdom and safety, that his leadership would lead to the blessing of God on his family and our nation. She would serve and do that for six presidents of these United States until she retired in the 1970s. And we've been going downhill ever since. <laughs> I would say Miss Emma Daniel Gray got it. She understood her life was more than a dust rag and a vacuum cleaner. She understood she was a priest standing between God and man, bringing people, as it were, to the attention of God and offering through her sacrifice of, of prayer quiet, unknown, faithful intercession. In this case, for the president. You know, I couldn't help but think, who knows? Well, capital W. Who knows? What God orchestrated and accomplished through the presidents of the past and current presidents because of people like her who have the boldness and audacity and courage as she had there in that Oval Office to represent the President to God. As you move through this coming week, view life as a priest assigned to sacred duty. No matter where you are, no matter what you've been assigned, 
at the moment. Maybe talk over lunch or write some things down about ways that you can offer your body your gratitude, your good deeds, sharing with others in need, financial gifts, self-sacrificing love, prayer. See, the truth is, beloved, we'll never know until much later what God orchestrates and arranges and accomplishments and accomplishes as a result of his church made up of priests who understand they have a sacred relationship with the Lord who rescued us from the quarry of sin and emptiness and hopelessness and death and judgment who shapes us and fashions us and fits us into his assignment for this week. And this is then our sacred response, the privilege of perpetually living life as an offering of all these sacrifices to our living Lord, knowing that at some point the building will be finished maybe today. In the meantime, we understand, beloved, that this is what it really means to live a deeply spiritual, holy, sacred life.